Here we go. Hey, welcome to Coffee Compiler Club. We're going to talk about compilers and types and cyclic imports and anything else to do with compilers and language runtimes and null and not the null and I don't know what else. Um, open mic, say what you want. No prescribed uh, order of conversation. Um, you're being recorded live. You'll be up on YouTube within a day or the week if I forget because pandemonium is in my house. Um, that's my spiel. I'm done. Uh, I guess on the table, I, I think we're closing out that intersection types can type anything, but they might get exponentially big, or they might not normalize, in which case using a mega type as a TD, I don't, I don't type this no more. Does that sound about right, Alan? Well, okay. So, so the main issue with intersection types is that they're really, it's really hard to figure out the intersection type of an expression. <laughs> for a while, the only way to type, uh, to, to, to find out the type of an expression was to normalize it and see, and if it doesn't normalize, it gets this omega type. And if it does normalize, then you could basically go through the syntactic form of the normal form and it deduce the type from that. Right. That's what I said in the last discussion, at least to me, that the intersection types are kind of an escape catch because uh, to avoid to unify them, you just say that that thing is composed of two separate types and you can continue on without, well, without, without reducing, without uh, finding a principal type for it. Well, so there, are, there have been there has been work that, that has found principal types in better in, in, in easier way. So, so like if you get an arbitrary unreduced expression, there are ways now to find the inner the type with intersection types. Um, so how an intersection type would deal with indoor string? So those well, if it's if it has like so if it has a simple type like a simply type lambda calculus, we'll find a type. Intersection types are a superset of that, so it'll just use the simple. The simply type. Okay, so but interstring. For sure, you can make an intersection type that is between int and string. How would you well, further no, reduce it? How you would normalize it? The intersection types are really only useful for functions. Like if you have a, I mean, if you have a set like like interstring, the intersection is going to be empty. So like you'll you'll get, I mean, you'll you'll you you it'll give it an the empty set. It so, won't. I went out so a different way. You happily will give it an intersection type because it's an intern string, but how you can actually reduce it so you can use it, it will be not, right. not that useful. At least well, to me. So if I use it, it'll be an int or a string, one of the two. So you'll so the intersection type system will deduce that type for it because okay. it's fully normal. If you haven't runtime objects as we discussed in previous discussion if you have a runtime something that can be called an object that's a runtime you can probably propagate that to a runtime check to find that what is actual instance of a string or an int and continue yeah there's a runtime check involved mm. that's where i ended up mm. so intersection wasn't the empty it was the other way around you got you're both an int and a string and I didn't want to bother with the runtime type or figure out what it means in all cases. I just said. Well, I was I was reading this paper about what was it? It was called Foresight, this programming language from like the 1998 or something. Uh, this is all links. You throw links in the chat. There are links oh, in the doc. I'll, I'll I'll throw the let me let me see if I can find the report. Um, but basically he was saying um, so he was saying. So he was like, oh, actually, you know, my my programming language is not going to use um uh <coughs> it is not going to use uh set theoretic intersection types where the intersection uh, yeah. is the um but instead it uses like this pullback thing. And so like basically depending on how you define the pullback the intersection can either be a pair of the two of the two types or it can be the empty set or it's somewhere in between and he he ended up somewhere in between i forget what the exact definition was what differentiates that from the set theory version 
Well, so as a set theory, you you have the pullback is always um, the, the intersect. So if it's empty, then it's empty. And so if the, there's no inhabitant that is in both types, then the then it's empty. So the pullback, you have inhabitants that are in both pipes. And uh, darn it, so yeah, I have probably- Where I ended up with, I, you know, it's only camera, the name intersection union seem backwards or something. You had to be both an int and a string. And if I were to give you runtime semantics, I'd have to carry along an int value and a string value and runtime check it in each use site and say, oh, here you're behaving int-like, I'll take the int half but you'd be a double-sized thing with both ints and strings, which I declared is not an exciting language or something. Not a sensible language choice, you know, Python. Yeah, yeah here, I, okay. I, found the, I found the report. Um, it was, Maybe yeah. Cameron throw it in the docs. Yeah, I threw it in the chat. Okay. Yeah, in JSON land, I've definitely seen APIs that are like, I will give you the integer number of things that exist or a string that explains what the error was. Yeah, right. And and for me, I would say it's time to switch to uh, you know a classical result type where you have an, a, an enum that's okay or, or error, right? And uh, you know, tag the enum and you get one or the other and the tag tells you and, you, and you know, at that point, you're doing a runtime check to say, I'm tagging out an answer or I'm tagging out an error. So if I were an AA, could I make something that was a int or error? You could do a tag union, which could be an int or whatever you put for the error value, but a compiler error is a programming language error. You don't get past the comp the typing system. There's no execution. And the process of unpacking that would be an explicit unpacking, like in yeah. languages that have a maybe. Yeah, exactly. It wouldn't just be a if type not string. Yeah, okay. Well, there's if type not error. Now I know it's a string under it. Right. No, you could do shortcuts in how the semantics are expressed or how you write the code. And operator overloading can might make it a lot easier to look at. But semantically, it would be a tag union with two tags, one an error string, one the result that's strongly typed is whatever your result type is. But not what Alan and I are, have been talking about here, which is a type which is both an int and a string according to how it's being used in context somehow and needs a runtime check to distinguish that is implicitly put in by the language semantics. I'm not, I'm not going there. You, you want a runtime check, you wrote the runtime check, or you used a construct that said, I needed to do a disambiguation here. Or if the compiler can figure out which one is it. Yeah, and but separately, eliminate. if the compiler figures you out and declares that it's all, you know, Happiness and roses, then then you're mm -hmm. good. But that's the typing. I say compile the typing system figures you out. A, yeah. So there are definitely things where you can imagine having a map over a collection call and a function that mutates A's to B's, and the map call doesn't know, doesn't care, and I want to have raw ints on one side and raw strings on the input and the outputs or whatever I'm mapping them to, and now I need two different implementations of map one that's specific to ints and one that's specific to strings, but that's an implementation detail. From a typing systems point of view, map types are the Henley Milner typing because there's no conflict inside of map. He has an A type on the input and a B type for the output and a function from A to B and he's all happy. Yeah. So if I want a map in AA where depending on what the key is, the values are different types, <laughs> how should I implement that? No, um, you'd have to go to some sort of base wrapper type. So could you share that, Aaron? You the key, the value. So it's a different map. I'm talking about map over an array collection. He's oh. talking about a classic dictionary map. Oh. I, I have a hash table mapping oh. keys to values. Okay. Okay. Some keys only give me ints back. Some keys only give me strings back. Is there a way to type it? No, not without an, a disambiguation test on the value that comes out. <coughs> At least so, now I know. Okay, I mean, so so okay, so I should mention one other detail of foresight, which is that it has a value type which can contain any value, and so like the intersection of most types is this value, or sorry, yeah, not right, the, right, the union, the the least upper bound 
of most types is um, uh, is a type that can can Java Lang object. Yeah. 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 I have the same notion for the same reason. But you have to ask for it for integers, or at least my intent is you ask for it for integers that don't otherwise auto box you because the overheads for auto boxing can can be excessive. Fine. Right. So I looked it up in foresight. So foresight, the representation of the intersection type is that it's a, it's the tuple of one uh, one element from each type uh, and the risk, but it's restricted. So that in the in this value type, they have the same representation. So like same representation, so, meaning like Java Lang object and subclasses? Meaning that they're equal. So like you so like it basically it's a value such that when you convert it to a value and convert it to the other type, then it's equal to the other value. Pointer equality, bitwise equality, dot equals virtual call does it mean it wants equality? Equality, like whatever notion of equality you have for value. So so let's let me see if I get it right. At type level, you have an int or a string. That's the intersection type. At the value level, at the runtime, you have a tuple that has an int or a string inside it, or I, int and a string inside it. I would it. say something different. Hmm. I heard something different. I heard. I have a pointer to a box. The box contains either an int or a string. I can convert it from a pointer to int to a pointer to string, but I don't know what's in the box directly without some sort of typing test. No, I mean, that's a type level check altogether. That's a runtime check. Yeah. Oh, and, and you're going to say no, so I didn't get it right. <laughs> so it sounded to me like your lattice. So your lattice already tracks a this is the union of an int and a string, which is not a thing I can deal with. But yeah. there's a thing there. It's just yes, the thing is. that's there is an error. Um, yeah, yeah, fine. So yeah. in theory, if I took that error and I tried to meet it with either int or string, it should be an int or a string. No, you have to join it. Which Sorry, requires a cast, to... which is a runtime task. And then it's all good. I see. So if I have one of your int or string things, that would be an error if I tried to use it. Yes. But I put it in an if, and I say, if this thing is an int, Yeah. And then I have a bunch of code that treats it like an int. You're not going to blow up at me and say this turned no. into an error in the middle. The fact that no. it turned into an error and then turned back into an int before I used it no. is fine. So, right. So I don't use the word error for that term. Um, I use the word scalar as a Small thing I can put in the register that I can ask, you know, instance of tests on and shit like that. I see. So I went to scalar and then I came back to int. So now I'm fine. Yeah. You went to Java Lang object and then you went back to int, to Java Lang integer. This might, might be an easier way to think about it. Okay. So that'll actually work in most of the use cases where I yeah. would want something that is either an int or a string. Right, because as right, soon as I right. do the test, now I'm back in happy land. The, the, the consequence is you had to box the int. But once you box the int, yeah, you're done. OK. So I put like an example. I put like what he, the section I was looking at into the doc in the code block. Um, so like, I think, I mean, I didn't, I don't know. I didn't, I had to retype it. So it's not exactly the same. But I think it's what he meant. So. So basically, there is definitely a pair, x and y. X is yeah. typed with a, y is typed with b, and there's some sort of conversion that converts. Yes, yeah, so like this restriction that the conversion to the union type is, is the same as the conversion of the other side of the pair to the union type. So, mm, okay. So that's so, yeah. So it, and so, so what that basically saves you is that if the, the conversions are, are, by, are not bijections, you still have values that make it precise. Yeah, for me in int and car, I have uh, the lattice just takes one as a subset of the other and I'm okay. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, like even, if it's a subtype, then you can use the smaller value because the conversion to the larger value is unique. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs>
And it, with a set theoretic type, you know, it's, it's also very easy because you have, you always have a, a, an intersection set that defines what that the type can be. Yeah. But yeah. You know, the problem, I mean, the problem with set theoretic types is you have to come up with a representation for it. And like, of people, course. So, you know. Uh, what, it, yeah. what it means to intersect what don't have to come up with a with a representation for the intersect. Yes, I mean that's a lot of what the lattice games I'm playing are. It's mostly set theoretic, and there's yeah. mostly an intersection or a, a union, not entirely, but it's mm -hmm. it's close, and that turns into what does it mean to have a a, a member type that's type function function of mm -hmm. a to b struck with fields one, two, three, and now come up with, you know, set theoretic type representations, which I mostly did, so it's, it's there. Oh, oh well, that's the other trick. See, if you have open records, yeah. you can define so that like a, a record can be extended with fields. Yeah. So you can define a record type like that has fields A, B, C as the intersection of the record with A and the record with B and the re and record with C. So yeah, isn't that called row polymorphism? Yeah, yeah. yeah so, it sounds like that. I'm, I'm there already, but I don't claim there's anything weird with intersection types going on, or I didn't well, feel like intersection types. I mean, it's 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 just intersection types let you let you split the type down using intersections. So. Oh, oh, okay. I'm certain I have an intersection-like behavior going on in the unification of structs with varying counts of fields, where I look at the left and look at the right. And if they have common fields, it's great. And if they have uncommon fields, it depends on whether you're open or closed or left or right as to whether I copy the fields around. But it amounts to doing an intersection thing. I think. So it's it's there. All right. Well, let's 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 declare victory and move on to cyclic. Yeah, I, mean, I, I don't really care about intersection types that much. I just thought they were cool. <laughs> All right, fine. Um, yeah, I, so well, I sort of had about intersect. No, about cyclic imports. Yeah. Yeah. So I had two questions. The easier question is, what do you do if you have multiple different files that all import the same module? And I want to make sure that I have some init that runs the first time it gets imported. But I probably don't want that init of that module to run the second time it got imported or the third time it got imported. Yeah. And the second okay. one is when I have two modules that import each other. So, so the first one is Java CL on it. The rules are kind of, kind of a, more of a bitch than you'd think because of parallelism and multiple threads trying to import simultaneously. Um, yeah, Python does something similar where the first time someone imports a module, it runs the init and it sticks that module in a dictionary full of modules. Right. And subsequent times you import it, it just gives you whatever's in that dictionary. Yeah. yeah. But they have a global interpreter lock, which helps them with the two different things trying to do it simultaneously. Yeah, that's what Java does. The only other trick going on is while you're in a CL init, you can call methods that you can make a new instance, then call methods on it. And the methods are running uh, as instance methods on a not yet finished CL init. You can export them to other threads who can see those objects and want to call on them, but the seal init has not finished. The Wait, VM can you call those in a racy way? You call this function in CL init's not done yet? And, oh, it gets worse. And it gets worse. <laughs> and the, the VM stops you from doing this, and it has to stop it even though the code has to be jitted because the CL init is ginormous and runs like the entire part of the problem you're trying to solve, it's pre-computing Mandelbrot's for a large area, then it's going to display or something stupid. And that's all in the CL net, which is a giant Fortran piece of code. And it must be jetted or you'll suck. So the JIT code on CL net methods that are in progress and not completed have a, am I the correct thread added to the front of them? So if you're not the right thread and you got to the jitted code, you have to take a lock and wait till the CL net finishes. But if you are the correct thread, you get to carry on, and this has to happen cyclically, recursively. Do you know the historical motivation? Because I don't see a use case for allowing you to create oh, an instance of an yes. object of a... The, the, the standard historical motivation 
is this sounded really cool. Let's go do this. Okay. Followed by, oh, look at this corner case. And look at this corner case. Oh, this is fucked up. Let's fix it this but way. I, I That's think the, up. the common use case is singletons, right? Yes. Yes. I, 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 the other problem is, no, but those you don't have to write in a way that requires you to do it at static time before the class is initialized, right? You can uh, have well, like a separate that's the method. That's singleton pattern. It's just a static that instantiates an instance of itself. Yes. But tell us, tell us, Cliff, what happens when an exception gets raised by a CL in it? Oh, holy fuck! Um, <laughs> and yeah, then mix that, if you're not mix catching that it, into you what you out. just described. I'm sorry. <laughs> And then mix that scenario into the scenario you already described. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. And I had to make all this shit work. Um, the, the semantics are fairly well done. I mean, fairly complete here. The, all the corner cases got nailed down. You might disagree with them, but they got nailed down. And I believe that one, it just does the normal processing of an exception, which might terminate the seal in it, which would then go back to the thread that launched it in the first place. And if you haven't caught the exception, then that thread eats it and presumably dies. But the class got its seal and it finished. No, and you you end up with class not founds for that class in the Are future. You sure? which is, it, it blows yeah, the class loader yeah, out. Yeah, yeah I, I I was dealing with this recently. It's like, but it's also it tells like there's no way this class isn't found. But therefore, there must be an exception right. somewhere inside. I, I, I want to claim that that I. I at least seen it before the other way at some point in the past, but it's been 20 years. So maybe I'm just wrong. Actually, I think it's, it might be no class stuff, not class not found, but it's that okay. level, like all, all subsequent users of that class get screwed. Get, get, I would know. completely forbid this. If you want singletons, just have a get singleton or like get the instance method. And then that will do the locking thing as necessary, but you don't need to have that happen before the class is initialized. That seems just nonsense. So, yeah, but so then where, where are you going to store that singleton on a static? And now that static needs to be volatile. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is kind of a Java ism where everything has to be inside of a class thingy. If I can just put it in some global <laughs> thing, then. But same thing. If you yeah. put it in the global and it wasn't initialized at startup, right? Yep. Now yep. that thing can't be final and has to be volatile and you pay that cost indefinitely. Yep. On x86, it's just a load. Yeah, the volatile costs on x86 are fairly cheap if you're mostly only loading. Store, uh, load after store, store after load, one of the two is expensive. But the common singleton behavior is you just load and you test and you're good. And that's that's cheap on x86. Not so cheap on other processors, but cheap on x86. ARM would be now volatile. Be but it should only be set once. So shouldn't the slow moving optimizations help you there? Um, the slow moving optimizations only kick in in the seal and it. If you have a bunch of fields in a seal and it that are static final and the seal and it completes, they'll now be treated as constants by the compiler. In particular, asserts work this way and the hard guarantee on performance for turning asserts off is because the compiler totally takes the assert expansion was that if this debug Boolean in the seal and it is true or false and he does constant folding. But the interpreter sees the if load a Boolean and do something. So yeah, the slow moving optimizations have to happen after the seal is completed and then the JIT kicks in. If the JIT kicks in during the seal he doesn't believe that your static finals are in fact final. Which brings me back to what's going to happen if you have something that is a cyclic import. If my CL init imports you and your CL init imports me. Well, usually, no, no, those are well-defined scenarios. The seal in it processes things in a particular order, like it lays out all the initializations and function calls and do more initialization in order. If in the middle of doing some computation, you take a, a reference to somebody else, you, you pause this thread and you go do that guy in the same thread. Um, and the rest of your seal in it are listed as not yet initialized. So they get the null, they get the uninitialized Java value, which is null. And because you're in the seal in it on the thread in question, but you're doing a nested seal in it on somebody else, you can reach back and find those static globals and you're allowed to touch them now and they will be null. And I run into this all the time in my AA implementation. So that's the, the short answer is it will NPE? Yes. And, and okay. if I screw around with something on some of my very early initialized type things and I get it wrong, I, I get an NPE right away. Yeah. But as long as you're careful about the nulls, it sounds like the Cyclidium port is totally 
a reasonable thing to do. Right. I mean, the, the semantics are, I took all your seal and init expressions and put them in a big old static seal net and I execute them one after another. All the initial values before I turn anything on have been set to zero. And then if in the middle of doing one of those expressions, you call a new guy over here, he starts at his beginning, does the same thing through and then, then recursively next and next and next, all in the same thread channel. And then some guy at the bottom goes and gets a public export that was given away over here and refers to this guy who pulls a null out. Then he, he blows up over here saying, I went to the static final not null value, but it was null and I died. But it's yeah. in, in Java, like it's, it's so safe, right? You like the cyclic import, you do nothing, it's fine, right? It's all, and then you start adding static initializers and it's still fine. And it's only when the static initializers start cross-referencing each other that things okay. get interesting, right? right? So like, cyclic import all day long mm -hmm. what i what i end up doing is i'm trying to make commonly used and reused types that are themselves cyclic um so i want to make a cyclic type or a type memory pointer points to a type struct which has a display field which points to a type memory pointer because i'm making a, a display in the type system you know pascal style display in the type system i get a cycle TMP refers to type struct, type struct versus type field, type field versus type TMP. And if I get them out of order, I get a null somewhere and I blow an MPE and die. So I sorted that out a long time ago. It was a pain in the butt. But yeah. Yeah, that sounds like that's good work that has probably saved my butt multiple times without me ever knowing it. Without you ever knowing it, yeah. The, the only really evil magic trick is you can't change threads if you've begun a seal in it on a thread. And uh, uh, and you, you go to a different guy who does something else, and he spawns a thread which needs to do work, like open a database connection because you're trying to get the JDBC driver <laughs> golden instance. Um, that other thread makes a reference back to your first guy. He blocks because he's the wrong thread. And then you get a deadlock at CLNet time. And the VM actually checks for that. He looks for deadlocks. If he's pausing a thread that is doing a CLNet, uh, because the, the, it's the wrong thread, he immediately does a deadlock check and will throw you a deadlock error under some, I don't remember the circuit, but there's a no, no, it, 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 it will, it will flag the deadlock in a stack trace. You won't get an exception. You won't get an exception. And then, okay. the, and the stack traces are really funny too, because like what triggered the seal in it, it was the first time you touched that class. So you get some, like you're making some random call, right? Maybe yeah. you're calling a static method or new. There's no synchronization mentioned anywhere, including in the stack trace. And your thread's just there forever in a deadlock that you don't know what you're deadlocking on, which is again, like, oh, so this must be static initialization. This sounds about right. <laughs> like so your said, error is not, your not straight that I, line. Not that I've dealt with deadlocked. this recently. The error is your straight line code just deadlocked? Yeah. Yes. Yep. Interesting. <laughs> And, and think about it the other way too. It's that first touch of the class. It's not the import that does anything. Yeah, it's the yeah. first time you touch the class. So you could be in the middle of some, you know, completely CPU bound method and then initialize the world. Yeah. If you I could also have and uh, never... uh, network packet interrupts come in and trigger all kinds of toxic behavior. Certainly H2O was, would get all kinds of setup fails that were exactly that, where the cluster oh. is coming up. Somebody's first launching work from somebody to somebody else. It's a network packet. I take a network NIO interrupt. Hey, I got something. And then he starts in the network handler trying to do seal init for everybody who immediately wants to spawn to somebody else in the cluster who wants to do his seal init. And I would have cross cluster members deadlocks that were tied up with multiple NIO threads talking to each other locally on the one node. Early on in coherence, before it would, we had to code. So before it would join, try to join the cluster, we'd actually enumerate all the classes in the entire thing and load them and cache them just to make sure they weren't garbage collected. And da -da -da. That's a good idea. I fought so, my way through the, those cyclic dependencies, but no, there, there's actually, that's a good answer. Everybody in the networking stack and the serialization stack and a couple other stack pieces, I would have said, yeah, you could have walk them all and just touch them to get their seal and it's done. Yep. And you do yeah. it on a single thread. So it's before you, before you introduce any of the concurrency. Yeah, yeah, no concurrency and stuff like that. No, that's a good answer. I like that. So if I import something, but all of the use cases are in dead code because I'm on a different operating system or whatever, the, and it will never run. If you, yeah, if you never, if you uh, could rule here, you get a linked class that's not loaded or loaded, but not linked. 
you can reference a class in your interpreter methods that will, will declare it referenced in the method and it has to, I want to say load, but not link. Until you execute you, it, you don't link it, I think. So Aaron, the, the, imp the import means nothing. Java? Yeah. Yes, and, and the import means nothing. This this I'm 100% with Mark on. Yeah. It's it's when you so execute. It's the first time you get to a dot. You yeah. Find it the one. Yeah. That is not necessarily what I would guess would happen, but seems like a totally reasonable behavior. Exactly. It may be the right behavior once developers know it. Yeah, in Java, the uh, otherwise statement. imagine what import star means. Yeah, import statement doesn't do anything in Java. It's it's just a hint to the compiler how to do name resolution. Yeah, yeah. It's name, name, well, it yeah, actually in Java C, it tells what things show up in. Yeah, if he doesn't find you in the code, he doesn't even show you up in the class file. If, even right. if you have import this run away. If, even if you have an object in Scala, if you don't touch it, it doesn't get loaded, no matter it's imported. Somewhere. Yeah, that's that's Scala leaving, leaning on Java, yeah, which you have to, or you get this syndrome of you you touch one thing and you import the world. You know, Apache yeah. Org Commons, I touch something in there, and you know, two hundred megabytes of Org Commons got sucked in. Uh, you you die. So Aaron, your question about imports at compile time, static imports as uh, for a static language or Python, in, do you have Python in mind? So I had something that was doing sort of run from the top down in mind, but I had it mm -hmm. reasonable. Is this yeah. for a language that's pre already there or something you're doing new? Excuse me. Mm, I was mostly thinking about it in the context of like AA, which, <laughs> Has yeah. to run uh, through everything and do the imports, and I, I still go back and forth between being Python like and being Java like. The import does something. The import only names names, and something happens later. I, I don't know. I probably need to go the Java route because you want to maximize your laziness here. Um, I haven't I haven't sorted that one out. We did both. <laughs> So we use we use import as a uh, as a, um, a directive on a package statement. So a package you can create a basically think of it as like a directory and a file structure. You create a package and then you say this package imports a module, and that is actually the the import action. But outside of that, the import statement is only used for um, aliasing. Okay. Yeah. Name resolution. But aliasing, but but for the static compiler, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. We got quiet here. Have we beaten the idiosyncrasies of Java imports to death. But there is there is another complication. I mean, if if you're writing the compiler, yes, circular imports in terms of actual circular dependencies across modules. Can be uh, can be quite a challenge. A lot of languages just disallow it altogether, so they don't have to deal with it. Yeah, I don't know. I, I currently support cyclic things of the for reference completely in AA, just because you have to have for references within a function. But as soon as you extend that to modules, it should work the same way. But there's a bunch of hacks go on in the. Well, basically in the type system to say I'm I'm stalling what this thing means until I get more information about it. Right. So it ends up being the most most conservative possible thing it might ever turn into being. And then it lifts up to whatever you end up with it when I get there. And I stall all typing analysis on it until I find the definition. And that was a pain in that to get in there. But you can't write like factorial without it. like go write the standard recursive factorial. Can't do it without having some sort of recursive definition game going on. Not sure what uh, your thought is, but I think it makes sense to at least have one boundary where you are not allowed to have cyclic things. So like Java modules, you can't have cyclic module dependencies. Like Go packages can't have cyclic dependencies. I think it makes sense to at least have one layer of that code hierarchy where you are not allowed to do the cyclic stuff. 
so that you can factor things and so on. Yeah, that's a stylistic issue, which might entirely be be good. Uh, yeah. Like, presumably, there's some semantics that make sense. You both include the entire cycle and you analyze it all at once, and that makes sense. However, no, but why? Why bother? Why not just force why, this? Why? Yeah, the next one is okay. Tell the end user to get his shit together and quit doing this weird ass thing. Which is what you know I ran into when I was doing my my pointers to structs to fields to pointers thing ran into I had to get my shit together and quit doing the thing which I did it the hard way but it was a pain in the neck you know I, I basically wrote the cycle breaker in the seal and it who referenced parts from other functions that he knew was going to be null because it couldn't be completed in time and so he did something on behalf of that seal and it it's like ah geez what the hell but I, I redu basically reduced my cycle down to what fit in a tiny function that I put in one of my steel ends. Duck. I didn't have a way. I, 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 because I'm actually making a cycle, I can't actually not have a cycle amongst the members here. So you could also argue that that's not a good module boundary. That's, I don't package or not. It's just two different, three different classes. That the module itself stands alone, doesn't need to depend on something else. I think that's regional. But in AA, you are planning to have some boundary where you can't do cyclic things? Uh, TBD, I, I yeah. could. I, I'm planning to have a boundary that's a module boundary. Mm -hmm. I'm probably going to demand that you type the module boundaries instead of me doing inferencing on it. Yep. Um, and at that point, I'll probably also demand they be acyclic. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a billion package dependency programs out there that understand acyclic module types well but do not understand cyclic module types so well so i'll just you know dodge that bullet and say at a module boundary whatever that is so, so there's another layer in the universe where i arbitrarily add a restriction the typing system can handle it the code can handle it whatever the runtime handles it but i demand that you not do this to make your life easier so that's me telling you what makes your life easier that makes sense to me i like I've been told this will make your life better by lots of folks that I don't necessarily agree with. <laughs> so I'm always leery about going there. Yeah. But maybe this one's okay. Scala does too has some machinery to break the cycles between classes, but there are some illegal cyclic references that we you call, call them right away and report them and stop compile. Okay. But so you're 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 piggybacking of Java's. Mm -hmm. Some uh, there there is some machinery to break the cycles to delay them so we can resolve them, but I I haven't explored how exactly. Yeah. Right, right. Well, I certainly have machinery to in AA to delay cycle resolution until the last mm -hmm. half of the cycle finally shows up. Yeah. yeah. So the best I... option for cycle is to delay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, until you get the whole of the cycle present. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, different Next topic. <laughs> um, and I'm I'm feeling very run down, so I might abort early too. Hmm. All right, everyone's all so quiet here. I haven't. I I told Cameron the, that I would find the use cases for dependent types, but I haven't. So we can we can discuss at least if you want. Use cases for what? For dependent types, what exactly uh, they look like. Oh, I don't want to do dependent types. Okay. <laughs> That's me. But you know, both of you want to go there, I don't, but I, I can I can carry along. So um, you, you I'm, I'm in the middle here. I'll do the AA update. I'm in the middle of doing, you know, merging the type theory side with the production side of AA is fine. I'm in the middle of acknowledging that I have all my ints look like structs from the type point of view that have functions like add, subtract, multiply, divide on them as fields that he does lookups on. And so in the in the Henley Miller referencing side, if you have an unknown untyped thing and you do plus three, then he decides the unknown thing has to have an operator plus that he's still yet typing, whose second argument will be a three. So it's a two arg function. And and then, then then he's okay for a while until the the type shows up on the you know the other that's, half. That sounds awfully similar about um, Scala's column types. It assumes that it has some prefix, and 
it will delay a resolution. That sounds well. It's, Hindley, it's standard Hindley Milner. Mm -hmm. The only difference being is that I am, I am not. I, I am as a as a. I want to say performance optimization, not related to the semantics. I am declaring that the types don't carry fields for every possible function on an int, for instance, but mm -hmm. they defer them to a, a class or a prototype. So when I go look up for a field in, in a class object, if I fail to find that field, then it is acceptable to pull up a, a basically a final class field that is a function. And if I find such a thing, I declare it. I, I just, you know, I, I would have shoved it into the int thing in the first place, except I didn't want to blow out every possible integer with having bajillion fields every time all over the place. So it's just a shortcut at that level has no more semantic meaning than I, I delay when I jam that field in. So it's as if every int is a struct which has fields for every static final operator. Um, and I do the standard field lookup to go find your operators. So because it's structural, does do we do we doesn't we can caught up in some kind of net of too many methods of some part of structural and you you part of the resolution you end up with some object that has to have a bazillion fields from this unified from this taken from this it has to have from this and you end up with a at the end you end up a type that has a pretty much all of the fields doesn't uh, can I, we I end up with the situation most integers will show up with most interesting add subtract multiply fields mm -hmm. okay Maybe but not. what about what about classes that share uh, uh, if it's structural they can share some fields they can share some methods yeah but it, you only get forced to have a field if this is row polymorphism if mm -hmm. you uh if the field is asked for from from you so if you're an int side and nobody does the and operator or the zor operator, you never mm -hmm. pick it up. You only observe what it's used. Yeah. So if I make a, a, a map, a standard hash table map, he takes okay. a key. I ask the key for his dot equals and his dot hash. And I don't ask him for anything else. Oh. And as long as you support those two fields, you can use hash table. Yeah, then and supports in, them and float supports them and in strange. this slide in this slide they act like an interface so you need yeah. just these yeah. fields yeah you use those fields they have to show up in the case of ints they are as a as a sort of an optimization stored in the class for int um as a way to abbreviate the type or make the type more efficiently represented the other thing going on is i'm using fat function pointers so Every time I pull a function up, the the this pointer gets bound to the guy who did the lookup on, mm -hmm. which means if I have an int five, he has add subtract multiply divide functions. You semantically it's as if he has add subtract multiply divide and plus the 17 other int functions, where the first argument is bound to this argument is bound to a five. Mm. <laughs> which is a little bit different than maybe you might think. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds so. Different. That's all done by tediousness when I do the field lookup during Henley Milner and I fail to find you. Then I ask the second question Are you one of these cheaty guys? Oh, mm. go find it, go pre bind your this pointer, yada yada, and then carry on with standard Henley Milner after that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's in the middle of what's going on. And, and it's kind of fun, it's kind of weird looking, and it kind of working so far. And I got some bugs to work out, and you know, like I said, it's a work in progress. And I got sick and I'm having yet one more home thing. So knock on plastic, one more home thing done this afternoon. We sign for the final loan. We get rid of Vinny, the loan shark. Cool. And uh, I'll be much happier camper. Cool, cool. Congrats. It's actually not Vinny. It's, his last name is Hiss. Oh. Uh, <laughs> And I'm not claiming he's a snake. No. I, I'm claiming he he sold me some money at a very high rate at a very short notice. So he bought, you know, he bought it your for me. He bought your house. So yeah, right. Made it work, but wow. <laughs> uh, I have no complaint with the guy, mm. other than I, I want to get rid of that loan as fast as I can. Which he probably wants his money back as fast as he can too. It's all good. We're, we're all going to win in here. It's all fine. Okay. Fun stuff. Mm. Had uh, one uh, question. So, uh, 
in one of your talks, you said that the Azul hardware had a non-fencing CAS. So ARM has that as well. They have like non-fencing CAS and Atomic Head, but x86, you cannot, <laughs> if yeah. you do the lock x yeah. you can't like say, hey, don't fence. I wonder why they're so slow to uh, pick it up, or maybe it, it is better too much or in practice. It, it has a specific use case that Intel sort of, you know, ignored for years. Um, performance counters, if you don't, uh, if you don't CAS in a hot loop with a performance counter, you'll drop 99.9% of your counts. You'll, you'll drop counts to the rate of one count added per cache miss as the cache line holding the counter rotates between cores that are fighting to increment it. That in turn means that all nearby counts all flatten to one per cache miss and you lose all structure to the performance profile. It all becomes flat at one count per cache miss per unit of time per core kind of thing. Um, and so you can't tell the hottest inner loops from the second hottest outer loop because all counts are flat. It's kind of sucks. Okay, so you go to a CAS, then you have to do an atomic update and you still have to ping pong the cache line around. But if you also require fencing, then everything else you touch has to be stalled while the cache line pings around uh, to make sure it's atomically updated. So Azul had two or three different CAS fencing behaviors, depending on how you count. The other one was the cache line zero, which would specifically zero a line in your L1 without giving you coherence across the cluster. And you would lazily add a specific fence that was for cache line zeros that would get done before you published the cache line that you got. And that's so that you could zero lines in your L1 without needing to pull in dead memory from your main memory that you're about to zero anyhow, and then fill it with good shit. And then up until you published it, no one else cared that you filled it with good shit. And those are all stores. And then at the publishing time, you would say, okay, now I'm going to do a publish and I have to fence out at least the zeros. If separately you did a non-volatile publish, you did, and you got random crap, but you had to get the zeros done. But the zeros didn't have to come out right away. And it gave you a lot more time to get coherent anyhow. So you didn't pay the, the double cost. So one of the fun hot hacks that happens on Java on an x86 is if you lock and you allocate and you unlock and you allocate and you lock and you allocate, every time you allocate, you get new cache lines you've never seen before. Every time you lock, you fence for those lines to come in and they're full 100% guaranteed cache misses that you then zero. And then when you're done using it, if it's going to escape, not escape, but you don't know it and you have an escape analysis in a way, the cache is full. So those lines get written out and they get blocked on the fence to go out. So you get stalled on the fencing going in and out and all new cache lines for all new objects all the time when there was no coherence ever needed here. And that was one of the hacks is all work, you know, mostly around by having a couple different fencing domains. And in particular, we could get rid of one third of all bandwidth on a large busy web server using cache line zero. It's an enormous amount of enormous amount of bandwidth. One third of your bandwidth on anything that's bandwidth bound, which would be an x86, is straight to the performance. It goes right to your bottom line. Everything got faster. You quit stalling for cache misses. You just ran forward. Yeah, ARM has a cache line zero as well, and then but it has to be fenced properly, or it doesn't rescue Java. IBM had cache line zero as well; they failed to fence it properly, so it didn't help the Java situation. So I don't know if what ARM's zeroing does. They might have got. I'm right. not sure about the exact details yeah. as well. Yeah. You have to go yeah. look at the semantics yeah. Yeah. of yeah. when yeah. when they fence. Yeah. Yeah. You want to zero in your L1. You want to not load memory from your L2, L3 main. Fine. You don't want everyone else to immediately stall waiting for you to get coherently zeros in your L1 because almost always no one else has that line in their cache. So you want to delay a little bit and then the cache coherency protocol sorts it out and says, yeah, in fact, no one has it. So I don't have to stall when I write back this line. I just want to delay the decision to stall on write back until actually not too many clock cycles down the road after you allocate, you know, 100 clock cycles, one other unrelated cache miss. And then suddenly I've already got it coherent because they didn't have it in the first place. I told them to evict, they already evicted for free, it was done. 
right? For, and, and, and so if you just stall that decision a little bit, then when you're done with the line, you're going to throw it out. Everyone's already coherent. No one has to block for it. And it just goes out. And it's, it's free. Arm doesn't have store store. So if you like zero in it, an object, and then publish that, you need a fence. But on x86, you have store store. So you don't need that. So the, I think the, the, right. The, the fencing that I'm talking about on x86 is he's fencing both to bring it in and typically to bring it out. And you have to store fence the zeros as they're going out, at least, even if the guy in question isn't volatile. You don't need to emit an actual fence, right? You just need to ensure no, that the stores happen. I don't believe you need to emit a fence, but he ends up stalling in your store buffers, which if you're high volume doing this, you will start to back up on the store buffers. You'll run out of I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you use the... If you use the lock, if you just use like no, a, no. Like... if you do high volume allocations, he will start to choke up his outgoing bandwidth on his store buffers. Yeah, 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 yeah. Coherency yeah. across the yeah. cluster fast enough. Yeah. yeah. And if you had a separation where this line goes out, waits for the the it is it is a bug on the jitting part to uh, uh publish this line if I haven't done a CLZ on the line, but the two, the allocation and the CLZ separate in time by one cache miss, and then all the costs go away. So that's the difference. So, so you got the line by doing a bump pointer allocation, and then you enter the CLZ to zero the line. Separately, you did a fence on the CLZ, one cache lines worth of work later, and by then the coherency was done and, and it cost you nothing to fence them. But if you fail to put that fence in, then you might publish a pointer to the line that didn't have the zeros yeah, and somebody yeah, yeah, else yeah, could yeah, racially yeah. see the non-zero values. Yeah. <clears throat> so we talked about previously about pattern matching. I see a link by Yorick, the fourth link. Yorick, oh. can, you, can you walk us through about what is the gist of it? Yeah, sure. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, because yeah. uh, I think it was muted earlier. Ah. Um, yeah, so I, I spent like two months, I think, working on pattern matching for Inco. Mm -hmm. uh, I think three weeks of that alone were spent uh, reluctantly reading through papers. And yeah. When I say reluctantly, I, I mean really reluctantly. Um, does the Scala help, the Spaces file help about? So I, I looked at a couple ones. I, um, the first one that was... So back up a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Before implementing pattern matching, I first wanted to figure out which algorithm I was going to use for uh, compiling them. Mm -hmm. And ideally, I wanted one that did both compiling uh, and exhaustiveness checking instead of having to do that separately. Okay. Um, now there's a bunch of resources. So I asked, briefly took a look at um, this book from Simon Peyton Jones from like 1989 or something. It was like mm -hmm. the, the implementation of functional program language, I think it was called. Because um, people said, oh, on page 8 billion, whatever, uh, he he describes a uh, pattern matching algorithm. Hmm. But the problem there, it was all in like Lambda calculus. It's a scanned copy of a book, so it's quite difficult to read. And right. like half of it might as well have been Egyptian hieroglyphs. Because like, I, I understand yeah. some of these words. Yeah. Oh. But also it's it 40 years ago, so I figured you know, things changed. Um, then sort of fast forward, there's some algorithms from um, Marangat, Marangat, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, uh, in 2007. He wrote some papers, one called, uh, there's like two or three, but one of them is like uh, compiling pattern matching to good decision trees. Uh, and there's sort of work that preceded that. Um, I found an algorithm from 1996 from mm -hmm. uh, uh, Peter Sestoft, a uh, developer of the uh, Moscow ML compiler. And then I found some sort of, let's say, the uh, homegrown ones. So there's one from Scala. Um, there's one that I implemented here, a fairly recent one. And I, th I think I saw some other sort of homegrown uh, approaches here and there. For the exhaustiveness, the, uh... yeah. F f so some did one thing, some did other. <clears throat> um, I think my my issue was with the 
newer papers, like Marangetz, whatever, uh, I don't know how to pronounce his name properly, because it's French, so it's probably pronounced in an uh, okay. interesting Rob way. All <clears throat> um, but basically, they use matrices. Mm -hmm. And as far as I understand it, a lot of the complexity goes into building that matrix. Yeah. Mm. The problem I had with his papers and many papers in general is that they, they're all theoretical. They all use formal, they are not really formal specification, but um, uh, algebra, they are Egyptian shown, hieroglyphs, basically. Yeah, they're shown empirically how it's right. working. How it's and so I, I look at that and I just shut down. Like I look at it, it's like, I know I'm supposed to understand this, but I can't read a page that's basically yeah. you know, something you would find on the pyramid. I, I entirely yeah, sympathize. Simplify. Most of the papers um, are formally, formally shown, but never... Practically. Right. So it, it's, I guess, useful if you do understand that and you want to have like a proof that it's legit and that it's uh, you know yeah. terminating or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I just wanted some code. So I could look at it. Okay. How much does this actually take? Because there are a lot of people like, oh, better matching is simple. You just need a mm. few hundred lines. It's simple um, if you do it in the in the values, but everything else right. is. So I ended up with two papers. One is from Peter Sestoft from 1996. Um, yeah. It's a bit of an interesting paper. It, it's linked in the repo. Um, yeah, it's interesting in the sense of the implementation. It took me a solid two weeks to properly understand it. Hmm. Um, I think part of the problem is that they wrote it in ML. Like they actually have a code example in ML. Hmm. Um, which paper but you is can this? kind of tell it was written by a developer, not really a like a yeah. hardcore computer scientist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. it works, it's practical, but there's a lot of questions left unanswered. Of course. Yeah. So I found, for example, in their implementation, they use uh, pattern matching itself to implement this uh, compiler. Mm -hmm. um, but the patterns they specify are non-exhaustive. So apparently, mm -hmm. this was allowed at the time in Moscow mm -hmm. ML. And so I spent a lot of time thinking, like, okay, is this supposed to be that way? And are you, is it actually possible that you hit those uncovered patterns? And if so, what do you do with it? Uh, another problem I had there is that, and this took me quite a while to figure out, is that the paper implicitly requires on immutable, so implicitly depends on immutable data structures. Because uh, essentially what it does, it uses lists and it recursively uh, you know, calls, well, calls recursive mm -hmm. functions, passes those lists down, Mm -hmm. And then there's a particular point where it basically branches. It takes mm -hmm. the input list and it says, create basically the okay branch of a decision tree with input X, mm -hmm. and then create the fail branch with that same input X. And so I had this problem where when I translated this to using <coughs> immutable data structures, um, my compiler was completely wrong because that okay branch essentially consumed all input. And then the fill branch had nothing left or like some some random crap left. Mm -hmm. And so figuring that out took a, a couple of days. But so what I ended up doing um, is I implemented two algorithms here. One, the uh, Sestoff one. I did that in two versions. One is sort of a almost direct translation of the paper into Rust. Mm -hmm. And then the second one is a more idiomatic one based on um, sort of cleaning it up and trying to understand it. Uh, and then the second one, that it implemented was from, um, what was his name again? His full name. Uh, Jacobs? Blah, blah. Yeah, it, uh, I forgot his first name. Jacobs. Jewel, Jewel Jacobs. I was oh, just Jules Jacobs, yeah. yeah. This was a bit of a funny one. because So he wrote a little article in 2021 where he covered some of the existing um, algorithms and sort of provided a, I guess, alternative to this based on what those papers had learned. Hmm. And I think I came across this like a year ago. And I thought at the time, like, oh, this looks interesting, but I don't understand shit. So I'm just going to leave it. Then at some point, we, uh, I think a month or two ago, uh, pattern matching was discussed uh, here. And I got an email from the guy. And he's like, hey, I actually watch computer, uh, Coffee Compiler Club videos. I saw you talking about this. Here's my link. Oh. And I was like, I think okay. I've seen this before. Oh. But so it took me, I think, a solid three weeks to understand it, emailing quite a bit back and forth with the author. Um, and I think ultimately what the problem was, he had some examples in Scala, um, but they were kind of like sketches. Hmm. The variable names were like one or two letters. Um, it wasn't really clear what was going on. And also mm -hmm. when I tried to compile it with Scala, Scala was like, this code is not correct. So I was like, uh, <laughs> okay. 
Mm. So I had to fix that. Fortunately, quite easy. Um, but things like in in the example code, he um, is basically using hash maps, mapping strings to like strings. It, it's a very high level okay. sketch. And so okay. I looked and I was like, okay, how the hell am I going to translate this into something that actually does compiling and checking with like actual typing mm-hmm. stuff and whatever. Yeah, it's it's kind of like the internet meme where it's like you know how to draw an owl and you start with a circle Just and then you draw the rest of the owl. <laughs> yeah. um, so this okay. repository it mm-hmm. shows those two algorithms implemented in Rust. The Jacobs mm-hmm. one is just the idiomatic one because I see I see the the match the first match is on values the second match is a match with guards. Uh, is it yes? Yeah, so the does the support? Sestoft one, I, if I remember correctly, I didn't implement guards there because I couldn't be bothered. The Jacobs one supports guards or patterns, integer literals, string literals, um, uh, ranges. I don't remember if I added them. I think I might have added those just to Inco uh, itself. It's ranges, yeah. The first, uh, the first oh, one, yeah, I, just... it's range 10 to 20. Yeah, yeah so... Different. Explaining this, it, oh, it's, it's a still a little point. difficult to fully grasp. Sort of like I mm-hmm. understand sort of how it works, but it's quite difficult to explain it. Mm-hmm. The best way to envision it is it basically takes a pattern matching expression in your, your usual syntax. Okay. Then it says instead of doing match input bunch of rules, you just do match, and each rule is compared against an input. So mm-hmm. your top level one is you know if if you do something like match foo. Uh, case a b c whatever okay. it sort of translates into match and then case foo equals or is a foo yeah. equals b yeah. or you know, whatever yeah and then it sort of translates that into more or less a nested match tree it doesn't literally do that it spits out a decision tree but that's <coughs> kind of how it works so it's it's similar to when you would take a match expression with nested patterns mm-hmm. and you would sort of unroll that into explicit match expressions that are all nested in like the appropriate branches. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it has some other sort of semi clever things that it does there. In the end, I think it's actually a fairly elegant algorithm. Mm-hmm. Uh, like the resulting code is actually not that bad. So um, how uh, the exhaustiveness, uh, how would we, how it would materialize the exhaustiveness? Uh, some example that you can compile with this algorithm. For the um, so it, it has a bunch of tests. Uh, if you, uh, oh, wait, I think it doesn't update probably. Uh, but if you open a librs file in the Jacobs 2021 20, directory, oh, at the oh, far okay. bottom, there are a whole bunch of tests. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, I see it. They, they, they might be a little tricky to do because they are unit tests that not like actual mm-hmm. code. Mm-hmm. Um, but basically it compiles a decision tree and if it encounters um, a point where it basically runs out of sub rules, uh, if I'm saying this correctly, uh, let me double check before I say the, the wrong thing. Uh, compile rows, I call it uh, fail. Yeah, basically, if at some point it sort of compiles rows and it runs out of stuff to compile, it produces a failure node in the decision tree. Mm-hmm. Um, and so um, the way I ended up doing it is when it encounters that failure, so when it produces that failure node, it also just sets a flag that says, you know, the the, the pattern is, oh, sorry, the match is not exhaustive. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then to generate a list of missing patterns, you essentially traverse the decision tree. And sort of as you do that, construct the sort of patterns leading up to that. So can it can it report what you haven't checked for the Yeah. Instance? So if I um, I I think nowadays I might be able to share my screen on Wayland. Let me quickly oh, check. Oh yeah, if you want to share, hang on. Yeah. Um. Oh, host has disabled screen share. Yeah, I'm trying again. Uh, no, still I m- might have to update it. Uh, anyway, um, oh, wait a sec. You should go. Work. Yeah, should go now. But no, so it shares. I, I think I haven't updated Zoom on this one because I think newer versions oh. do have, have support. I I use on vacation for three weeks. So, uh, anyway, it 
it does um when you provide patterns that are not exhaustive it will spit out which ones you could add to to make it uh, exhaustive mm -hmm. um it's not like the most precise in the sense that for example if you match against a tuple mm -hmm. let's say a tuple of two integers and your only pattern is a tuple of 10 and 20 the pattern it says that you should add just a wild card so just say the, you know the pattern underscore is missing instead of True. I guess the more precise one, which will be a tuple of two wild cards, but mm. you could argue one is better mm. than the other. The wild, um, the wild, However, the wild if you have card. like, you know, uh, an enum, for example, uh, and you have, let's say, uh, 10 variants and you only include two, it will list the other eight. It will say, like, okay, oh, consider adding these. Cool, cool, super. Um, I think Can the only. You declare an error if you don't be complete. Yeah, yeah. So, so in my case, if it's not exhaustive, <laughs> it's a, a compiler error. Uh, it can also detect redundant patterns simply because they won't be included in the decision tree. Yeah. Uh, um, in, in my case, I do sort of when I encounter a body of a match case, it just records that basically in a list. That way to check which ones are included, you don't have to traverse the full decision tree. You just check, hey, is this thing in this list done? Mm -hmm. um, the I think the only downside, uh, the way this sort of works is when it um, when it sort of decides to branch for a given type, it creates a branch for every constructor of that type. So if you have mm -hmm. a Boolean, it essentially creates two paths, one for true and one for false, mm -hmm. even if you only list a true. Mm -hmm. So if you have an enum with like a million constructors, that means there will be a million branches in the decision tree, even if your match expression is something like case, the first constructor, else a wildcard. Mm -hmm. ah, cool. So it so does mean that if you have has to have matching. Them. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, it, it, so it, it, no matter do you import a wild card, do you use a wild card? It has to check all of them. The decision tree has to exhaustively check them. Um, not entirely. So in the sense that when you, um, if you have let, let's say because it's simple, let's say you have three constructors for a given type. Mm -hmm. And okay. you only list the first one explicitly. Oh. For that one, you know, it might have sub patterns or whatever. That one it will sort of recurse into and compile whatever sub patterns it might have, and then say, "Hey, once that's done, reach go to this body." Mm -hmm. For the ones that are not listed, it won't do that because there's no work to do. It'll just say, mm -hmm. "Oh, this thing doesn't have the, you know data." Boom, error. If you have a wildcard, it will detect and just say, "Oh, wildcard done." Mm -hmm. So it doesn't. It doesn't so much waste for cursing into things. It's just that if you're matching against some type at some point that has a lot of constructors, mm -hmm. your decision tree will be big. Yeah. It will be based by the number of constructors you have. Whereas in theory, uh, you only have to consider the constructors that are listed explicitly and have some sort of if else case to handle the missing ones. Handle all the rest, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And I, I tried to adjust it to that. I couldn't quite get it to work. Uh, and I was also like, yeah, most enums have like a limited number of constructors anyway. So who gives a shit? <clears throat> uh, and they're also, the optimization that I have is that in my decision tree, I don't store the actual code to compile. I just store the, basically the basic block ID to compile the code into. Mm -hmm. So the decision tree is quote unquote large in the sense that it might have a lot of branches. But in terms of memory, it's going to be uh, very minor because it's a bunch yeah. of like nested nodes and then they point to an int and that's it. So, so far, this is for values can detect hierarchy and classes. And I don't remember. So that. I believe it doesn't support uh, generic, general algebraic data types, the okay, GADTs. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Uh, subclassing, I have no idea because I don't support subclassing in Ingo. Yeah, yeah, that's. Good. I well, think if I think it could support it if your type system is aware of all the known subclasses of a given type. If I think yeah. so. Yeah, that wouldn't be too hard. It will look like sort of a, the unknown case, but uh, more complicated. About the instance. It, it's probably doable. Um, hmm. I think yeah, just the the GADTs. I I don't know if it would support it. Actually, it might. So uh, no, 
ADTs for okay, but G, G ADTs are more complicated because they can include um, types. Scala yeah. has had a problem with G ADTs with the two version, the three version they fix it. It's right. more complicated. But yeah, and, and then to I think answer your initial question, I did look at the spaces algorithm that uh, yeah. Scala uses because I mm -hmm. found that Swift also uses it for exhaustiveness. Yeah. Yeah, but the thing there is, it only covers exhaustiveness checking. Yeah. And I felt the paper was a little weird in the sense that it presents itself as a sort of generic algorithm that can be extended to your type system. And I was like, oh, mm -hmm. by the way, but we don't support GADTs. Mm, yeah. And there's a bit like, okay, that's fair, but that is a little contradicting. Mm. I also just couldn't understand it. Like mm -hmm. I was like, I, I, I don't fully grasp how this works. It's... Doesn't like it's it just seems a little too homegrown, hmm. uh, which hmm. you know, isn't necessarily bad, but I'm like, eh, <laughs> I don't know what I'm gonna run into if I implement this. Yeah, so in land of hotspot, we added in the um, we had profile data, they only had table switch, so so none of your problems apply except you have a large breakout switch, and it was definitely the case that the set of things that you switched on had a very lopsided distribution almost always. So it was worth it to stare at the distribution when you were done and reshuffle your if tests to uh, put the winners up at the top. So you have preserved semantics, obviously, but but almost always somebody wins and by a lot, there's a lopsided curve there. To reorder the if for the statement so we can be more efficient? So, yeah, Huffman encoding um, kind of thing. Yeah. 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 So, so in my implementation in Inco, I, I basically took this algorithm and then it's like, you know, draw the rest of the owl, had to implement it in an actual compiler. <laughs> yeah. Um, of their own vacation. So that's quite, quite a challenge. Um, that, you know, that's fully implemented. I finished it earlier this week. Um, I've now seen enough pattern matching for a while. So I, I hope I don't find any bugs because I'll be a little, or like that there are no bugs because I'll be like, uh, I have to go back to it. Um, test, test, test. But yeah, so what I did there is for strings, uh, currently also for ints and ranges, I just compiled to like basically nested ifs. Uh, but then for enums, it compiles to a jump table, yeah. or at least it will. I, I don't have yeah. that part. Like the, the part of generating bytecode isn't there yet, just my mid level IR. Yeah. Um, but the, the special case for jump tabling is for performance reasons or. Well, so in the case of an enum, if you have a tag that's a monotonically increasing value starting at zero, so you can trivially turn it into an array index uh, rather than, oh, if the index is zero, go here. If the index is one, go there and you know, have, have like 15. You basically have a jump table built in. You just got to express it that way to the code yeah. generator side of things. But for like strings, regular ints and ranges, it's a bit more difficult. Like for strings, there isn't really, I think, a way you could do that in jump tables. The closest I think you could optimize is do things like you match initially on the first character or you first check the length and sort of group the matches per length. Um, that's actually what I do in my uh, Lexer where when I try to detect identifiers because hmm. most of them fall in the same length. So I just say, oh, if the length is this, look at these five. If the length is that, look at the other two. Because uh, Rust also just compiles them to nested ifs. Um, for ints, in theory, if they are monotonically increasing and start at some value, what you could do is shift all them to zero. Yeah. Um, but I, I think Hot that has fairly there. limited uh, 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 applications. Like I think the most common case where you would match against raw integers is if you're consuming some sort of byte stream, for example. And certain bytes have a particular meaning. But in that case, you're not going to care about all 255 of them. Um, like this is what I do. in like in a parser, for example, similar, you might match on token types, but you won't always care about all of them. So it's fairly difficult, I think, to compile that into a jump table, unless you're fine with a jump table that has 255 entries. Mm. I certainly mm. used a large switch for parsing CSV files for H2O, which gave me not 256, but 50 entries bunch. And that turned into a jump table. 
in Java, which turns into performance. So you, he does the performance hack where he, he knows they're all disjoint ahead of time so he can restructure the thing. And he makes a Huffman encoded set of dense tables as the final. Right. Final and I thing think they're for strings in, if, if all the strings you're matching <coughs> against are known, or that they are in a pattern matching case, I, yeah, you could use perfect hashing. Uh, I actually, yeah. Uh, when, when I still had my sort of self-hosting compiler code in Inco, which I've gotten rid of since, um, the Lexer used a perfect hashing approach for detecting uh, keywords. Yeah. Uh, and that perfect hashing, basically, I used a gperf to generate the C code. Yeah. Like okay. a, you, you list the keywords, uh, spit out C code, and then a hand like manually translate it to Inco. Yeah. yeah. yeah I wrote right. a comment saying, you know, if you have to change this, go through this painful process. Yeah, yeah. Um, I ended up getting rid of that because I don't think it's really going to be a bottleneck for like the next 10 years at least. Okay. Um, and just the process was kind of painful. But in theory, <coughs> you could have your compiler do that for you uh, if you're matching against strings. But whether it's worth it, I don't know. Yeah, fine. Okay. Impressive, impressive work on the pattern matching. Congrats. Yeah, I, what I was done was like, it's kind of like, here, no, you don't have to do this. <laughs> I just shared it with other people. They were like, oh, oh thanks. Yeah. This, like, when I say reluctantly, I mean, like, really reluctantly. Like, I was grumpy for three weeks going through mm -hmm. this. Like, why, why, does, why has nobody else done this, apparently? Because mm -hmm. so I found plenty of examples of pattern matching, but they either didn't work, they only implemented part of it, they yeah. were super. They, oh, it's like, this for for a few cases the, you can do this and it will work but it once yeah. you get more serious about it so, so i had some where they uh, implemented this algorithm for um the, the french guy because uh, i can't pronounce his <laughs> name uh the matrix paper but i think they only implemented the exhaustiveness checking part not the compiling to decision trees part which is like mm -hmm. half of it mm -hmm. yeah and then there were some that were written in haskell people like oh, it's easy to understand i was like I don't mm. understand Haskell, so this, you might as well told me to go f myself. Yeah. Um, so I you know, hope that because this is Rust and Rust is generally readable ish, mm. Um, mm. it should hopefully be helpful to people. So, thank you for sharing your hard work. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Okay. Yeah, I was like, thank you for sharing your experience. And go finding implemented and functioning pattern match papers. That, that's interesting that there's way more people talking about the theoretical side of pattern matching than publish. You know. Yeah, I, I've kind of reached a point where if, if somebody ever says pattern matching is easy, I will slap them in the head because <laughs> it really isn't. Hmm. Well, I think, okay, maybe you should slap me then. So why can't <laughs> you do like a simple like if else chain, like if matches pattern one, then do pattern one class. Exhaustive checking. Because of the exhaustiveness and the types. Okay, okay. so if let, let's say you have a dynamic language, because maybe that's maybe I think we have to back up a bit. Uh, Python, for example, recently added pattern matching. And it's a dy dynamic language, they don't do any kind of type checking. That should be fairly straightforward because that you can just compile to like a nested if else, blah, blah, blah. And then your fallback is just something like, oh, race error, you know, fail at runtime. The whole problem uh, with these sort of statically typed languages that you would like to have that at compile time uh, you would like to have efficient code within reason like you know some people might take it too far but um, like for strings and ints you can't really do better in most cases than nested is but for enums you can uh, and it's that process of checking exhaustiveness that's quite challenging especially dealing with nested paddings wildcards, uh, maybe ranges, if you want to have like proper range checking. I don't do that. I just treat ranges as essentially being, um, pretty sorry, I treat integers as types having an infinite number of constructors. So even if you have like a range from like, uh, you know, uh, zero to uh, two to the power 64, the compiler will say, this is not exhaustive. You need to add a wildcard because it's simpler. Um, but so it's that whole exhaustiveness checking. It's compiling to a decent decision tree. 
and decent there being that you don't <coughs> duplicate too much code based on how you branch in a uh, match expression. So for example, if I do, um, let's say I have you know a whole bunch of, like I'm matching like a, a triple and each failure is like a bunch of different possible case. So not like Booleans, people use that as an example, Booleans are the most boring one, but let's say each column, so to say in the triple has like you know five different values, uh, constructors. Depending on sort of how, uh, sorry, what patterns you specify, there are sort of different ways you can compile the expression into a decision tree. And those will affect sort of how big it is, how many times it needs to test things. So one, uh, an, another sort of goal is that if you've <laughs> tested a value, ideally you don't test it again. Mm -hmm. So if I have something like, uh, you know, a match against a, um, let's say well, a, a, an option type and my patterns are uh, oh, a, a sum of some, you know, some 10, uh, some 20, uh, some whatever or nothing, right? If I've tested that it's a sum, I don't have to do that none case because I, I, you know, I already know it's a sum. Now, if you have only two possible cases, it doesn't really matter. But if you have you know, an enum with 10 different constructors, and you list, let's say, eight, uh, the same constructor eight times, and then you have a bunch of others. If you find that that first one, that first constructor matches, there's no point in trying all the other ones. And so that's that's sort of where the complexity comes in because you have to compile it such that you provide a balance between uh, not testing more than needed, but also not blowing up the code size by <laughs> sort of repeating things a lot. And that's oh. where the complexity comes in. And that's yeah, where dynamic have... languages, they can just skip that. They can just be like, yeah, we didn't, we're dynamic anyway. We don't give a shit. Well, I mean, isn't there another problem, which is that you need like information about what sites are hot to actually do a good job? Like you have to know, if you know that like one constructor happens like 99% of the time and the other is 1%, then like you clearly, you want to test for that constructor first, but like not. Uh, yeah, so, so the way in the, the Java, it might sorry. dynamically find that if you know something statically about your program, you can just change the code so that you check that, like you have like two separate pattern matching things. And then you can lay it out yourself manually. So like that. given a table switch or the other switch, whatever, with a narrow set of ranges and what you're going to jump to, but you're testing for a pile of ints, then what the current hotspot thing does is he looks at your profile data and he builds a, uh, a histogram sorted table, a tree that ends in a jump table. And the jump table skipped if the histogram comes down to one, but he starts by taking the hottest thing. And if it's within a ratio of the second hottest thing, he puts an if, and if it's not in a ratio, he tries to go for the table version, or he says, I'm gonna have to Huffman and code you and I'm gonna start splitting you uh, into multiple versions, or whatever. But he does a standard classical Huffman encoded breakdown. As soon as he gets far enough down to the low frequency counts, he switches to a dense table, if that makes sense. And having listened to you guys talk about this shit, it occurred to me that what you're talking about is a Carnot map for multiple things. I'm, I'm looking for a link for Carnot map. I'm going to throw something in the, in the docs here. But this is like a double E's take an arbitrary Boolean expression of tuple of multiple Booleans, write the minimalistic amount of transistors to test for all the different cases that are involved. And uh, you know this problem has been around forever and a day. Now you guys are like, hey, we need to actually have five or seven or 10 or more, you know, uh, there you go, kernel map, I was trying to get there, yeah. They got five enums in each of my tuples. I have 125 cases. And now I want to make a minimal expression tree, which covers the things that I'm testing for explicitly. That's Carnot map minimization, which are well understood algorithms that are not efficient. I mean, they're, in, they're exponential, whatever the hell. But if you're a hardware guy and you're doing transistors and Booleans, boy, it's really convenient to just like, this can be done with four transistors. And it's just a test left, test right, bang, 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 and I'm done, right? So there is some theory here for- in the wiki. I'm sure there's extensions there where if you know about the frequency of like toggling, like minimize power, you can even have like a different Carnot map that minimizes the yeah, transition. Yeah, you can put power in. I mean, I, I did the frequency obviously for execution on, on hotspot. 
Uh, but you had to have the execution profile data, which, you know, the tables are a big one to go profile on immediately. Table switch, whatever. That's, that's obvious. Go profile me now. In the wiki, I see the some kind of matrix approach that I believe that Yorick Yorick also mentioned. It. I had, you know, two weeks as a doubly undergrad many years ago, um, learning how to do them manually and then we were, you know, laying out circuit boards and you had to stop and you drove a Carnot map. And then you said, here, I'll put the transistor, you know, you're breadboarding your way along. Fine. Mm. We used it in anger. Then it turns <laughs> out it was useful when I'm writing just plain old junk C code or Java code where I have a complicated set of things that I don't have a pattern match built into C or Java. So I'm just writing them out. And sometimes it's just convenient to have a smaller, simpler expression to express the same thing. And then when you stare at it for a minute, you're like, oh, that actually makes sense. I'll, I'll live with that one as opposed to whatever I was going to write before. Yeah, one thing related, and you sort of mentioned this before, is if you have like phase transitions in your application, then the profile data that you might have gathered at the start may not make sense. What does the interface look like to say, hey, reprofile, have a tighter interaction between the language and the runtime itself to say, hey, right. I know that I'm transitioning now. Yeah. Retail. So the current, the, the at hotspot as we left it, as I left it years ago, didn't understand phases as a thing specifically. But I mean, instead, I can hack it myself if I like just use different classes and then like, right. like, rely instead, on class and loading. Yeah, yeah. What happens was you use new code that hadn't been seen before. Immediately, all these paths where this code couldn't happen, happen. The jitted code was incorrect. And he rejitted. As part of rejitting, he ended up taking the newer set of profiles. So you got a phase ordering behavior if you went through a series of phases. If you bobbled back and forth between two phases, where the two phases time spent in the phase could be optimized so well if you could blow off the other phase and then flip to the other one that you could pay back a, a complete recompile strategy there was some performance to be gained, but it's a very specific, weird use case. The usual thing would happen when you flip through phases and you flip to the same ones again and again, the code just got more generic and then he quit de-opting and he handled all phases and you let the x86's, you know, hardware prefetch and branch predictor like zoom through left phase versus right phase a little faster. And there were a lot of conversations back in the day of, you could reach it this and every, you know, there were a thousand more compiler papers put out about cool things you could do to handle ever more specialized cases that ever actually hit the you know table. But the common one, actually fairly common case of we have a phase, here we're this phase, now we're that phase, typically falls out in the wash because you loaded new classes. Uh, just add there for Ellen, so the Typical approach in pattern matching, um, sort of trying to figure out which patterns are more like common. Um, it doesn't really do that. It doesn't know at runtime which pattern is going to be more common. Although in theory, your compiler might be able to track the occurrences <coughs> of certain constructors and based on that deduce like, oh, this thing is so common, we're probably also going to pattern match against it. With our guide information support. Yeah. But what it does do if you have, let's say, um, uh, a, a tuple, the uh, a tuple of booleans, for example, you have like, you know, uh, three different cases, I think four in total, whatever. It does try to, so the, the way to envision that is it kind of turns in like a table or like a spreadsheet mm -hmm. kind of thing. And it has rows and columns. In the case of tuples, you know, you'd have two columns for each tuple. It does try to figure out, okay, which of these values do we uh, test for the most? And then sort of group it by that. So if you have like, let's say, um, uh, let's say you have an integer with three possible values and you know, a tuple of those ints. And you have like a pattern that's like one and one, one and two, one and three, okay, two and two or something. And then the wildcard. It will look at that and say, hey, we're testing against one the most. So let's start off by branching off that. So we only test it once instead of three times. And then from there, it sort of figures out sort of how to branch. Uh, Tree based on code, yeah. the occurrence of a pattern, yeah. yeah. I mean, this is right for a Carnot map, exactly what you would do. You look at your set of things you're testing and he draws little boxes around things that you can get with one test and then you don't have to worry about them and you have to draw another box for the next piece, but that's just the nest in the, the decision tree. 
I didn't implement a Carno map solver in Hotspot. So don't know. But the win there is probably in a weird place. If I know I have a bunch of disjoint paths that I can take, and one of them is much more common than the others, and I put it first. You the win is win. not really that I'm saving having to do three or four ifs. The win is that I didn't have a branch predictor memorize the four ifs that are never taken. So now there's more space in the branch predictor for other branches elsewhere. So your win is probably going to happen pretty far away from the optimization. But reordering branches is for speed optimization. The exhaustivity, exhaustivity checking still remains. Well, you really want to know your exhaust. You want to know that you have independent branches before you reorder them. Mm -hmm. I mean, like exhaustivity checking is like a specification issue. It's like, I mean, you just sure. say, you just say at the end, if no ca if no cases match, throw a dynamic error. And like, that, that's your scenario. Mm -hmm. That's the easy case. You can always uh, uh, throw a wild card for totality, but uh, you, as you see, Yorick is much, much more involved in the pattern matching. Yeah, it's well, it's it's like type checking. I mean, if you want to, like, if if you have errors as like values in the language, and like when you're checking the type, you're ensuring that errors are not part of the type. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, how uh, Yorick, one question I forgot: uh, Does it um, does the algorithm deals with overlapping from the cases from the cases which you consume? So if you reorder the if, but the if is more general than the second it consumes, it will never fall through that case statement. Um, so it doesn't handle overlapping patterns. It does handle redundant ones. Hmm. So if you specify the same pattern twice, it will detect that. Um, uh, let me see if I can- The partial on. overlaps. Yeah, if you have like range like you... patterns where one is like range one to 10 and the other one is five to 10 or like mm -hmm. one to nine or something, it won't say, yeah. hey, that might not work. Mm -hmm. yeah. But if you say match against some int and it's like twice you say, oh, if it's 10 to A, if it's 10 to B, it will say, hey, that second one is redundant. Okay. Right. If you have like one to 10 and then later on you have like five to 15, yeah. do you have an ordering that says the first guy is hit first or? Yeah, it, it does top. Top bottom, uh, okay, top, yeah, yeah, yeah. top to bottom, yeah. left to right, basically. That's, that's why it's dangerous to reorder branches because they, yeah. you can change the semantics. But so okay, pattern matching, weird. Next yeah. topic. Yeah, I'm I'm actually running out of steam here for being on a cold. I think I'm gonna any any last request, and I'm gonna call it here and see if I feel better next week. We'll, get, we'll queue it for the next week. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. All right. Thanks. All right. Fun stuff. Until next time. Good night. Bye. Bye.